The gentleman yields back. Uh, other members are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. Uh, on December 6, 2017, Kirsten Nielsen was sworn in as a sixth secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. This is also the secretary's first appearance before our committee. Uh, we thank you for being here today. Uh, your full statement will appear in the record. The chair now recognizes the secretary for an opening statement. Try that again. Thank you. Uh, Chair McCall, uh, Ranking Member Thompson, and distinguished members of the committee, it's a privilege to appear before you today. I'm honored to present the President's 2019 budget request for the Department of Homeland Security and discuss how that budget will help keep America safe. Let me first take a moment to thank this committee for its support for the $48.2 billion provided to the Department in the recently passed Consolidated Appropriations Act. The support of this committee is critical to advancing the many DHS missions, and I truly thank you for your continued support. I'd also like to thank you for your support for our reauthorization. As you know, it is critical that the men and women of the department have the tools, resources, and skill sets that they need to further the mission of this country. The President's 2019 budget builds on the FY18 budget and requests $47.5 billion in net discretionary funding for the Department of Homeland Security. It also includes an additional $6.7 billion for the Disaster Relief Fund for response and recovery to major disasters. Today, I'd like to outline several core missions empowered by this budget. First, securing and managing our borders and enforcing our immigration laws. Two, protecting our nation from terrorism and countering threats. Three, preserving and upholding the nation's prosperity and economic security. Four, securing cyberspace and critical infrastructure. And five, strengthening homeland security preparedness and achieving resilience. Within all of these missions, we're aiming to put our employees first and empower our frontline defenders to do their job. This will help mature the department and, more importantly, help us better secure the homeland. For border immigration, first, we're focused on securing and managing our borders and enforcing our immigration laws. While we have made vast improvements in border security over the last 15 months, we continue to see unacceptable levels of illegal drugs, dangerous gang and transnational criminal organization activity, and illegal immigration flow across our southern border. The current statistics for last month tell a dangerous story. Overall, the number of illegal aliens encountered at the border increased more than 200 percent when compared to the same time last year. Perhaps more troubling, the number of unaccompanied alien children encountered has increased over 800 percent, and the number of families encountered increased over 680 percent. We also saw a 37 percent increase in drug seizures at the border in March, and I am sad to report we have an increase in 73 percent in assaults on our border agents. This is unacceptable, and it must be addressed. We must do more to secure our borders against threats and illegal entry and close dangerous loopholes that are making our country vulnerable. We have been apprehending gangs, TCOs, and aliens at the border with historic efficiency, but illicit smuggling groups understand that our ability to actually remove those who come here illegally does not keep pace. They have discovered and continue to exploit legal loopholes to avoid detention and removal and have shown no intention of stopping. These legal loopholes are strong pull factors that entice those looking to circumvent our laws. For border security to work, violation of the law must have consequences. As I've said many times, interdiction without the ability to promptly remove those who have no lawful basis to enter or remain is not border security. It undermines our national security, and we must work together to close these loopholes. This budget would invest in new border wall construction, technology, and infrastructure to stop this illegal activity. I would be remiss if I did not say that one of our greatest investments is in our people, recruiting, hiring, and training additional U.S. Border Patrol agents, additional U.S. Customs and Immigration Enforcement officers, and additional support personnel to carry out these vital missions. Secondly, we must continue to protect our nation from terrorism and decisively counter threats. This is the reason the department was created, and it remains a cornerstone of our work. Terrorists are adapting. 
they're taking an all of the above approach to spreading violence. That includes promoting tax on soft targets, using homemade weapons, and weapons they can bring in a bring your own weapon style approach. It includes crowdsourcing their violence through online radicalization, inspiration, direction, and recruitment. But they also remain focused on conducting sophisticated attacks, including using concealed weapons, weapons of mass destruction, and modifying new technologies such as drones into deadly weapons. This budget ensures that our defenses keep up with the innovation of our enemies. For instance, it allows TSA to employ advanced tools to detect threats. It funds new CBP initiatives to identify high-risk travelers. It ramps up our defenses against WMD, and it provides vital funding to protect soft targets from concert venues to schools against attack. Third, we are focused on preserving and upholding the nation's prosperity and economic security. On an average day, the Coast Guard facilitates the movement of $8.7 billion worth of goods and commodities through the nation's maritime transportation system. Each day at our nation's 328 air, land, and sea ports of entry, CBP welcomes nearly 1 million visitors, screens more than 67,000 cargo containers, arrests more than 1,100 individuals individuals and seizes nearly six tons of illicit drugs. Annually, CBP facilitates an average of more than $3 trillion in legitimate trade while enforcing U.S. trade laws and processing more than $2.4 trillion in international trade transactions every year. The President's budget helps provide critical resources to these efforts to keep our country competitive and to advance the prosperity of our people. The budget also will help us continue efforts to keep foreign adversaries from stealing our trade secrets, technology, and innovation. Fourth, we must secure cyberspace. This is one of my personal priorities as there is much to do in this area. Our networks are under attack constantly from all corners of the physical world. That's why DHS is taking historic strides to address systemic cyber risk, secure .gov networks, and strengthen the security and resilience of critical infrastructure. The budget would enable DHS to support state and local election officials in defending the integrity of our election systems. As you know, the department's mission is to provide assistance to election officials in the form of advice, intelligence, technical support, and incident response planning with the ultimate goal of building a more resilient and secure election enterprise. Through investing in hardware, software, intrusion detection, and analytical capabilities, we're better able to secure the digital ecosystem that makes our American way of life possible. Fifth and finally, it is a core mission of DHS to strengthen Homeland Security preparedness and achieve national resilience. Last year, according to NOAA, our country experienced one of the most costly and damaging seasons for natural disasters in its history, with a cumulative effect costing $300 billion. Through the FEMA and in cooperation with state, local, tribal, and territorial governments across the country, we will devote the resources and attention needed to ensure recovery. But we must also help communities across the nation create a culture of preparedness to be more resilient to disasters. A culture of preparedness is a national effort to be ready for the worst disasters at all levels. This budget helps us with these efforts and supports the DRF, which is necessary to help state and local governments respond and recover. In conclusion, we need to empower the men and women of the department to carry out these five missions and many others by giving them the resources they need. In addition to the various areas I mentioned today, I am also firmly committed to maturing the department and putting our employees first. It is an honor to serve alongside the men and women of DHS who work tirelessly each day to secure our country and who are often unrecognized. I thank them for this service. I thank this committee to support our budget in supporting our employees, supporting our missions, and helping to make our nation more secure. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I now recognize myself for questions. Uh, First, uh, let me just say this committee passed a historic um, border security bill providing $38 billion in funding uh, for the wall technology personnel. I've joined Chairman Goodlad and his uh, uh, legislation to, to close legal loopholes. But I think before we uh, get to that, I think you have to justify, uh, to justify that need. It's, it's important to look at the threats that we face uh, from the southern border. Uh, your predecessors, both uh, General Kelly and Acting Secretary Duke, talked about transnational criminal organizations providing a potential means for transferring weapons of mass destruction uh, to terrorists. Uh, there are reports today that this caravan is on its way to Tijuana. 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the threats uh, that we face as a nation and why border security is so important? Yes, sir. So I think the way to think about it is any threat that we face as a nation, if it can and will, if it can get across our border, our adversaries will do all they can to bring it across the border. So what we look at is everything from drugs uh, to the transnational criminal organizations you mentioned, uh, to smugglers and traffickers who smuggle all kinds of illicit things, not just people, but weapons, potentially weapons of mass destruction, uh, other illicit technology. They avoid our trade regulations. Uh, putting our economic prosperity at risk. Uh, and we see increasing violence on the border. I would also point out that we have seen ISIS and written materials encourage ISIS followers to cross our southwest border, given the loopholes that they also are aware of. So we have a multitude of threats. We have emerging threats, as you know. We're probably likely to talk about UAS at some point today. Uh, but UAS is yet another uh, form of threat that we're beginning to see more and more at the southwest border. Yeah, and I recall uh, being briefed on a um, ISIS uh, sort of bragging about the ease with which it would uh, take to bring a weapon of mass destruction into the United States. I have to take them that seriously, as they uh, appear to be warning us uh, of their intentions. When we talk about closing legal loopholes, um, you know, the first bill I ever filed in Congress uh, 14 years ago was to end the catch and release program. And here we are, <clears throat> 14 years later, still dealing with this problem. I'm very frustrated, as I know you are. Can you tell me why uh, this is so important? I can. Uh, so the, the way that I think about this is in terms of home security. Uh, if you have an alarm in your home and you catch a burglar and you call the police and the police come, and in fact it is an illegal entry into your home, but the police then tell you that they have absolutely no ability to detain or remove those criminals and the criminals stay in your house, you would not tell me that is home security. That is what we face at the border. We stop people, we interdict them, but we do not have the authorities, given the loopholes in many cases, to detain and remove them. We are forced to release them back into the communities after they have committed crimes. We have eliminated the administration, the administrative use of catch and release, uh, which was popular in the last administration. Uh, we do all we can to enforce the rules that you have passed, but given some of the court cases and some of the legal loopholes, we are unable to do that in all cases. And I think to most Americans, they, they just don't understand that, how that could possibly, you can detain, but you can't deport them, and then they get released into the, our, our society in, in the United States. This, this so-called described caravan, as I understand it, may be already in Tijuana. In your opinion, if they cross into the United States, which is their full intention, uh, what will you be able to do? Well, I think we have made uh, quite clear, first of all, the attorney general has made quite clear, we have a, a zero tolerance uh, for illegal entry, uh, but we have advised in every way we possible uh, that we are aware of uh, to let those participating in the so-called caravan know that participating in a caravan does not give you any additional legal rights. If you illegally enter our country, you will be referred for prosecution. If you file a false asylum claim, you will be referred for prosecution. If you aid and abet or coach someone to break our laws, you also will be referred for prosecution. So we're very clear about this. We will enforce our laws. Uh, it's an unfortunate situation that there's a belief that by coming in groups, uh, it affords you some sort of legal protection that is not otherwise afforded under our law. My concern is with the legal loopholes, which is really Congress's role to act. Under Article One, we have the authority under the Constitution to, uh, to uh, pass immigration laws. If we fail to act on these legal, legal loopholes, uh, my concern is they, they will be released. You'll have the same problem with this caravan. Once they come to the United States, uh, they will be detained and then released into to our society. And that is, uh, that is Congress to blame, uh, Madam Secretary, not you. And that's why it's imperative, I think, Congress act on this bill that we have uh, before us. My final question has to do with aviation security. I'm, uh, as you've received the threat briefings, I can say everyone on this committee has received uh, the threat to our aviation sector, the briefing uh, involving computer laptops and, and poisonous gases. I, can, I think I speak for everybody on the committee. We are very alarmed by this, and we want to do everything in our power to make sure the American people are protected on, on flights, both domestic and international. Uh, we appropriated in the omnibus $65 million uh, to move this forward. Uh, we will uh, complete that full appropriation in September for 300 
CT machines so that your men and women can properly screen at airports to protect Americans from explosive devices that may not be seen today. Um, my question is, how quickly can these machines be deployed? And then finally, I think the highest risk are the last point of departure airports coming in from Istanbul and Cairo and Riyadh and places I've been to where the air, air, airport security is not as good as ours. And what is your plan to make sure this technology is also at those, those last point of departure airports? As you said in your opening statement, sir, unfortunately, uh, the terrorists continue to see this as a crown jewel, if you will, of attack vectors. Uh, we also remain very concerned uh, about aviation security and in particular how quickly the adversary is advancing tactics and techniques and weaponry uh, to bring down an airplane. So the CT machines, we thank you for your support. Uh, they are critical and are very critical in our ability to detect these emerging threats. As you know, we're testing uh, the machines as well as the algorithms that go with them that enable us to detect these new threats this summer. Uh, we look forward to the appropriation in 2019 uh, so that we can, in fact, cover down over uh, the United States in terms of protecting uh, Americans here. Last points of departure are another uh, type of threat area that obviously a plane comes from a last point of departure to the United States. Uh, what we have done there is, you know, last year we substantially raised the bar in aviation security across the world. Uh, we have a tiered plan. We continue to work with countries to encourage them to adopt the CT technology. In exchange for that, we pull back on other uh, requirements that we have levied on them. So we have uh, tremendous outreach occurring. I met with my G7 uh, security ministers Monday, Tuesday. We talked about this again. We talk about this almost in every uh, way we can. Uh, but you're exactly right to highlight uh, the threat, and we will continue to focus on it. Well, thank you. I think it's one of the biggest threats that we face from, from the terrorists today. Uh, it, it is a spectacular event that they like to talk about, not a one- to two-man operation or a vehicle assault. It, it, it would be a major uh, event that we want to do everything we can to work with you to make sure it never happens. So thank you for being here. I now recognize the ranking member.